Now, the, uh, we're continuing to look at the subject of faith, and in particular, we've been reading from the 11th chapter of Hebrews. And last w- week, we saw how the heroes of faith in the Old Testament earned their re- eternal reward because of their endurance or their perseverance of faith in the face of the insurmountable challenges of life. And in verse 2 of Ephesians 11, it reads, For by faith the elders obtained a good testimony. And as we saw last week, every Christian is encouraged to persevere, to endure in the face of hardship when their faith is challenged. Now there's a flip side to that, to the whole question of endurance. There's a very positive outcome to endurance because that endurance teaches us. It teaches us how to handle life. It teaches us how to have faith. And the Apostle Paul talks about it in Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14, when he says, I forget those things which are behind and I reach forward to those things which are ahead. I press towards the goal for the prize, the reward of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And what, is, what he's saying is this, is that he won't allow the negatives of events or the discouragement of people to divert him from his ultimate objective when his reward is in heaven. He's keeping that in focus whatever happens to him in life. Now, this is the thought that I want you to hold this morning. Sure, it's, be, it's hard being a Christian at times, but we have to keep the objective in our mind. We have to keep the end focus, the, the focus of our, or the objective of our vision in mind at all times, even when the, the, uh, the going gets tough. And we're called to endure, to persevere, because this develops our relationship and testimony of who we are in God. Now, as you go through if, uh, Hebrews 11, you'll find that the writer uses many terms which we would call legal terms, terms that we'd use about going to court. Here's some of them. If you go through this chapter 11, you'll find these words, witness, testimony, promise. You know, most court cases are about promises being broken. All right, disputes about that. Declarations, reward, imprisonment, these things are the, are the terms used in this, in this chapter. So from all these words, we get our sense that our lives are a testimony to our relationship with and our faith in God. And this faith will stand us in good stead in the judgment day. Because inevitably, each one of us will one day have to give an account And this is where faith comes into play. And this faith will stand us in good stead. So we're going to look at this subject this morning. One of the great lessons, I think, for the Western church to learn. We live in such a comfortable existence in the West. Since the fall of the Soviet Union in in the late uh, 1980s, Threats have seemed to have disappeared, but now they're rising again. More threats to our existence. And we've lulled back into an easiness and comfortableness of life. And we here in New Zealand, stuck out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, thousands of kilometers away from any other neighbor, we tend to live a very isolated existence. And we're very comfortable. We're a very satisfied people, and that is the problem. One of the great lessons for the Western church is something which has happened in my own lifetime. And I've used this illustration a number of times, but it bears repetition today because it's an outstanding illustration of the subject we're going to talk about today. It's the story of the explosion of growth of the Chinese church during the Cultural Revolution revolution from 1966 to 1976. Now you've got to get an idea of this. 
Missionaries from nearly, nearly every European country had worked in China since the early 1800s. In fact, in 1925, it was uh, estimated that there were over 8,000 missionaries at work in China in 1925. That's where we know the story of Hudson Taylor and the China Inland Mission came from. And in the 100 years of operation, with all those thousands of missionaries, the church had grown to a number of about between 700,000 and 800,000 people. Then the Cultural Revolution came. And after 10 years, there was a change. The Cultural Revolution banned or confiscated churches, banned printing of Bibles, banned prayer meetings, no gathering together, no proselytizing, nothing. You were, you were put in prison if you did. Everything was shut down. Ten years later, after Mao died, the Cultural Revolution came to an end. And you know what? The 800,000 Christians had exploded into over 20 million in 10 years. Unbelievable. It's an irony that Mao did for the church in 10 years what the missionaries had tried to do for 100. There's a story in that. There's a message in that. There's a lesson in that that we need to learn. So the big question out of all of this, all of this is how did it happen? And one of my things when I go to China, I love talking to people who, go, who went through the Cultural Revolution. Some of them break down and cry when I'm talking to them. It's a very emotional thing for them. But they were magnificent Christians. The answer to this, how did it happen, is very simple. In a situation where all earthly hope seemed futile, the quiet living of a Christian's faith shone forth and was a, mean of wit and was a means of witness. So this morning, let's see what Hebrews chapter 11 has to teach us in this day and age. Firstly, testimony. Verse 2 of this chapter says, For by it, the, by it means by faith, by faith the elders obtained a good testimony. Then down in verse 5 it says, By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. His testimony was he that he pleased God, and that's why God took him. Actually, I like the, the message paraphrase of verse 2. It says, faith is what distinguished our ancestors and set them apart from the crowd. You see, faith is something which is very active in the soul of man. It's our testimony towards God. Get that? It's towards God. It's not a, this word testimony in chapter 11 doesn't talk about our testimony towards the world. It's our testimony towards God. That's what it said of, of Enoch, that before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And so much so that God recorded him, that God took him. What it means is this, is that he didn't die. It is believed he's one of the two people in the Old Testament who never saw death. We can say that we're in training here on earth for eternity. And one of the things that we're being judged on is our faith. And verse 5 says, Before Enoch was taken, he had a testimony that by faith his life was pleasing to God. Someone has asked the question, if being a Christian was a crime, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Obviously, Enoch's life pleased God. And there's another little theological point which is worth noting here. It comes up in chapter 11. It ends in verses 39 and 40, talking about all these heroes of faith. It said, all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. And the promise was what? 
that there would become a redeemer. That's the promise. That was Jesus. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. What does it mean? It means that all the Old Testament saints and patriarchs will be resurrected as part of the church at the second coming of Christ. That's what it really means. So what happened to them when they died? Where are they? Just a little diversion for a moment. I'm gonna paint with a very broad brush here, but it's, if you're really into study and wanna find something out, go and have a look at it. They were kept in Sheol, part of the underworld we, we know in the Greek New Testament as Hades. It's the, it's the place of abode of both the righteous and the unrighteous up to the time of Christ dying on the cross. Then after the crucifixion, Jesus descended into the underworld and preached to the righteous dead and led them to the ultimate resurrection uh, with the New Testament church at the second coming. Very broad brush, a lot of theology you can go and find if you want to sort that out. But Paul wrote about this event in Ephesians 4, verses 8 to 10, when he said, you know, remember for, uh, Ephesians 4, 11, says about the gifts that he, that he gave to the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. It, the two verses before that say, therefore, he says, when he, Jesus, that's Jesus, ascended on high, he led captivity captive. Who were the captives that were captive? They were the Old Testament saints. And he gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended. What does it mean? But that he also, that Jesus also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. So Old Testament believers look forward in faith to the cross and they weren't disappointed. But Jesus reached back and fulfilled the promise the Father had made way back in Ephesians chapter, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when he gave the promise that there was salvation coming. He says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. That was speaking about Jesus. Here's the whole point about faith and testimony. The testimony of your faith is Godward, not manward. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. Enoch had this testimony that he pleased God. Verses 39 and 40, obtained a good testimony through faith. So this testimony is not about what man thinks of me, but, a, but what about God thinks of me because of my faith in him? This is between me and God. God looks at your faith, your trust in him. That's what's important to God. He wants us to trust him. In the middle of the situations, in the middle of the pain that we suffer in this, in this comfortable life, he wants us to trust him. All of us carry pain. All of us carry baggage because we're all broken people living in a broken world. But through him, through our faith in him, our testimony before God makes us righteous. So firstly, a testimony. Secondly, a declaration. Verses 13 and 14, talking about the heroes of faith. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, they were assured of them. They embraced them. They confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. For those who say such things, declare plainly that they seek a homeland. Your faith makes a statement. It's a statement of your life. To declare plainly is to make a statement. And we'd all like our lives to be a statement. Abraham did. You know, I just love this whole example of Abraham. Verses 9 and 10. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country. God gave him a whole nation to rule, yet he dwelt there as if it was a foreign country. He didn't exploit it. 
You know, we see the problem today in many nations. If you get into the ruling elite, this is where your wealth lies because you can rip the country off. I see this happen in the last 30 or 40 years in Papua New Guinea. I read the headlines in the paper the other day. They had calculated that since they had had, um, their independence in 1975, I think it is, $150 billion has gone missing. That's amazing. Enough to provide all the roading and all the hospitals and all the schools they'd ever need. But it's gone missing. Why? Because people think the ruling elite sometimes think that the country belongs to them. As somebody has said, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. These are the challenges that we face. So by faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. The way that Abraham lived made a statement. Here he was, king of a whole country, and he made a statement, how? By living in a tent. He could have constructed the most palatial palace in his, that's ever been seen for his family and himself. Instead, he lived in a tent. Why? Because he looked for a city. He waited for a city which has foundations, which build and make her as God. That's making a statement. You see, in the natural We want to make a statement as to how we live and why we live in such a suburb or a house. Yet, Abraham waited for a city which has foundations. We look around this city. We live in a very temporary city. What we see, if you come back in 200 years, probably none of this would exist. Changed, gone. You get the message, but he looked for a city which has foundations. For we walk by faith and not by sight. By faith, we see the real things of life, not the temporary things of life. He lived in a a land of plenty, a land of abundance, and yet Abraham looked beyond it. Today we live in New Zealand, a land of plenty, a land of abundance, many jobs, welfare, support. Here's the question. What do you live for? What do you, live, what do you wait for? A new house, a new job, a new car? What's your vision? That's the question God's asking of us today. The economic wealth of this country can change in a moment. Someone has said if the US sneezes, the rest of the world catches a cold. What are we waiting for? Do our lives reflect our faith? That's a good question. I'm involved at the moment in a project which hopefully will produce funds to help underprivileged kids here in New Zealand and in Africa. And I've ended up some meetings with consultants and professionals telling them why, they, why, they, why I am doing it. They've asked the question, why do you do this? And the response that I get is absolutely astounding. And I have great delight in sharing what motivates me. It's faith that motivates me, nothing else. It'll make a good book one day when we've got time to tell tell the story. What we do and what we don't do makes a statement to the world around us. I was approached by a young man this week with a lucrative business proposal. And afterwards, I. I said to my wife, you know, that's a great deal. It's legal, but it's not ethical. I don't want anything to do with it. You know, what we do in our, or or don't do, makes a declaration of our faith. Verse 14 of Hebrews 13 says, for here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. No continuing city, 
The word is continuing. This city will pass away. The Bible says one day this whole world is going to be renewed. This city will pass away. But we have a continuing city, a continuing city which will go on for eternity. That's our faith. That's our hope as Christians. So our testimony of faith is towards God. Our declaration of faith is to the world. And thirdly, our witness is inspired. Hebrews 12.1, Therefore we also, since we're surrounded by so great a witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. We're here to give witness to a self-absorbed world that there is hope. There is someone who loves them. They're not the result of a chance happening in, uh, in spluttering primeval ooze did life suddenly begin. There is an order, there is a designer, there is an author to life. There's a purpose in the world. So how do we, how do we exhibit that? By loving our neighbours. You know, we reached out to an elderly couple who lived next door to us. We've been trying to share the gospel with them for quite some time and... Uh, interesting couple and they went to Australia for two weeks recently so we offered to pick them up on their return home and Jane cooked their homecoming meal for them stocked up them with fresh bread and milk and everything else like that and two days later we got a lovely note from them you know we've sealed our friendship with them we have an opportunity now we've taken the the friendship to a deeper level. And, you know, I, I helped Jane. I, I, I drove the car to pick them up. But Jane's witness was inspired. She showered them with love. And that evoked a very positive response from them. It broke down barriers. Jesus said these words, he said, a little longer the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live. You will live also. At that day you will know that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. He who has my commandments and keep them, keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. The word manifest is an interesting word. Come to that in a moment. What these verses are saying is this. We are in Christ and he by his spirit is in us. And because of that, our lives will manifest Jesus. Think about that. Now the Greek word translated manifest is an interesting compound word. It's comprised of two Greek words. And it's an interesting word, and it comes out as infinizo. And it comes from two Greek words, which means on, which means in, and phaino, to shine. And to manifest means to shine out of. And it's interesting, we get the same English word, emphasis, from the same root, exactly the same root. And it means when, we, when you emphasize something, you, you make it shine out from the rest of what you've said. It's an emphasis, an emphaticness. And that's the power behind Christian witness. And what Jesus is saying is this, that, it, that in my life, his love will shine through us to others. When we say it's inspired, we mean the spirit of Jesus shines out of us. And that's what Christ was talking about in the Sermon on the Mount when he says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. It means my spirit, who I am, will shine out of you. It will be made manifest. So just let your light shine to those about you in life. So our testimony of faith is of God. Our declaration of faith is to the world. 
Our witness is inspired. And lastly, our reward of faith is from God. Hebrews, 12 verse, uh, Hebrews 11 verse 26, speaking of Moses, it says, he esteemed the reproach of Christ, greater riches, worth more than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Moses was adopted into Pharaoh's house. He could have been one of the ruling elite of Egypt. He had all the wealth, he had everything he needed from Pharaoh's ha house. But he looked beyond that. It's interesting, again, the Greek word translated look means to look away from something, to fix your gaze on something else. That's what it really means. And here was Moses, born and raised in Pharaoh's house with all the honor and riches that went with that exalted position. And he chooses to look away from all of that. And he fixed his sight. He fixed his vision on what God had for him rather than what the world would give him. That's the challenge of faith. What a challenge for us today living in, in this post-modernity society. What do we put our faith and trust in? Politicians? Bankers? When the next economic downturn happens, where will our faith be? In the ruling elite to sort it out? Where will our faith be? Only in, they are only interested in what they can get out of the system. But remember this, God doesn't want or want for anything. He is totally, totally self-subsistent in himself. He has no need for a relationship. He has no need for anything in this world. He is the ultimate giver, the ultimate giver of love. And faith enables us to share His life with ourselves. That's what it's all about. Faith takes us out of this world and, live, and lets us live in the hope of eternity because faith is the substance of things we hope for.